Hey, robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So let me get over to our slides for today and let me just turn down that volume there as well. Great. So yes, today is all about robotic arms and I'm going to show you how we can build a, our own robotic arm, which is a 3D printed monster. It's nearly a meter tall, this thing. We'll have a bit of a theory on inverse kinematics as well, just to refresh your memory of how this can work. Uh, and we'll have a play around with that in some Python with some Jupyter Lab notebooks as well, which is pretty cool. I'll give you an update on the build as well, tell you how that's going. These have been some epic prints, they've been taking quite a while. And I've got one of my 3D printers kind of out of action at the moment, which is, uh, this is the last thing that was on the, the bed there. And uh, yeah, for some reason it gets to a certain height and then it stops stops printing properly i think it's basically just it needs a new hot end or something or just cleaning something like that and i'll show you some future plans and i'm going to be developing this with vm as well so we'll be able to do some really cool stuff with vm and i'll get over to exactly what that is shortly and if you're here for the live stream we'll also have a bit of a mailbox and a bit of a q a as well cool so let's get over to inverse kinematics so we'll talk about forward kinematics first. So if you want to position a robotic arm, one of the things you often have to do is work out all the different joints on. So if I bring up this uh, monster of an arm here, I've got this arm here and I've got all these different joints. I need to be able to position each one of these servos um, to make the end effector, the bit that we want to, the business end of the robot arm, whether it's a, a gripper, a camera, a microphone, a light, whatever. We want that to be in a particular place. So we have to figure out what position to move all those servos to. So forward kinematics would be, you basically just set them manually and hope you hit the right spot. Inverse kinematics basically allows you to specify an end point and then it will work backwards through each of the joints, figuring out what that needs to be and to get you to that position. And then you can move your arm to that position. So the process of inverse kinematics involves lots of maths, Simple maths, it's trigonometry, it's kind of high school maths, uh, but you might need a, a bit of a refresher on how that works. And the more joints you have in your robot arm, uh, the more complicated, although the, the, more, the, the number of um, calculations you need to do is just a little bit more, but not too complicated really. So we'll start with um, how we how we basically put this all together. We're gonna start with that end point. So on this little diagram here, if I just move my mouse here, so this this is the business and this is where the camera is going to be this is going to be a motion control camera arm um, so this is where the uh, the business end is and we need to work out this joint here this joint here this joint here we know the lengths of each of these sections so each of these sections has got like a known length from where the the pivot point is which is sort of where that uh, metal piece is just there that flange and where that will be at the very top um, that's also a known distance. So we know the distance of L1, L2 and L3. L3 is basically a very small bit that the camera is on at the end. So imagine you've got this robot, robotic arm, you've got these three sections, you want to know how to move it. And we're going to, for the simplicity of demonstrating this today, we'll imagine this is in like a 2D space. So we're not looking at pivoting it around. Um, on the actual base of this robot, you can actually pivot this around this little uh, stepper motor there as well, so it can, it can swivel. But effectively, the rest of it is two dimensional. So we need to know the length of each of these segments, which we do, but we need to find out what the angles are for each of those different servos. So we've got one, two, three different servos to, uh, to maneuver around there. So how do we go about doing this? So to position, we need to basically solve about three different triangles. Might be a few more depending on where uh, we start from. Well, effectively, we just need to figure out from the final segment and work our way back through each of those um, different arm segments. So the actual robot's arm can also be constrained. There might be um, a particular joint. I've made this so that it's designed to be quite um, maneuverable. It can go around 360 degrees, but in reality, it's on a desk. So it's at most gonna be 180 degrees. And if that desk is against a wall, it's probably gonna be 90 degrees. So we need to constrain that as well. We can build that into our, our calculations later on, but for the purposes of just working out the inverse kinematics, we can just stick to imagining that each of these can rotate um, to the full extent. So let's go through this step at a time. So first of all, let's have a quick refresh of our trigonometry from high school. So if we have a triangle, a right angle triangle, uh, we can work out what the length of the hypotenuse is simply by multiplying the square of the adjacent side with the opposite side. Uh, so we can use um, adjacent and opposite, which on there is tan. Uh, 
uh, so we can use the tangent function to work out that. We can also use cosine, which we will do as well once we know the adjacent and the um, hypotenuse si sizes as well. So this comes back to this soccer toe, if you remember that from high school, uh, and this is just a reminder of how you, what the three different functions are. Now in Python, in the maths library, we've got access to all of those, so we can make it a lot easier on, our, on ourselves. So how we use this uh, to figure out the length, if you remember, this is just how you do it. So each of the sides of the right angle triangle um, is the, <clears throat> the square of sides A and B will give you the... the uh, the square of sides A and B will give you the square of side C. So if you get the square root of side C, um, your job's are good and you know what that is. And that's often what we need to do. If we're working with right angle triangles, which we will be doing, um, we just need to know what that um, opposite side will be. So the, the Python function there is C equals a square root of A star star, which means um, the square um, squared. So squared 2 plus um, B um, star star 2 which is the square of side B so the square root of side C gives us the length of side C so this cosine rule um, we can work out the angle of A because often this is actually what we're shooting for it's the angle to move that servo to while we're trying to demonstrate this with my arm here when we're trying to move this uh, this robot arm we know what the lengths are so we just need to work out what the angle is so we can use this cosine rule to work out the value of an angle from those known side um, lengths. So a square is basically b squared plus c squared minus two times b um, and c, and, we, and they'll get the cosine of a. So if we look on the little Python code there, a equals a cos, which is just a cosine function. And um, we're basically putting in there two different things, b squared, c squared, and then we're minusing from that a squared, and then dividing uh, two times b times c as well so that little bit of maths there is part of that soccer toe of the cosine rule and that will give us the angle of a which is what we're looking for in this particular example so how we can do this with um i'm going to use two um different angles here so imagine there's like a third one along the the top there but we don't need to do that for this very simple demonstration so we need to work out two different angles to get um the position of so if we look at here we need to get this Q1 and Q2. They're the two different servo positions that we're looking for. And we're going to pass in X and Y. So we don't really care what those angles are going to be at this point. We just say X and Y is where we want the end of our robot arm to be. So the end effector where the camera will be. So first we can draw an imaginary triangle. Uh, again, it's a right angle triangle from the origin point from where the, the base pivots from. So in our case, the base will be the uh, wherever this is attached uh, and that particular pivot point there that will be the uh, if I look at our diagram there that will be the very bottom of x and y so that'll be our zero point and then we we know the lengths of um, side a and side b but we don't know what that bottom x is and we don't know necessarily what the y is so uh, we need to figure those things out now um, to figure out what r is r is basically the square root of x um, squared plus y squared and that will give us this size r and once we've got that we can we're on our way then to figuring out some other triangles that we need to resolve so we can define a new triangle this um now that we've got r defined we can figure out what the alpha is there in the middle and that's going to help us figure out what q2 is because we're gonna have to work back remember from the from the origin point so i'll put on there the, uh, the sort of mathematical equations for each of these but you might prefer the, the sort of python code if you're not uh, mathematically minded like that but essentially r is as we've said the square root of um, x squared plus y squared and what we're looking for is this alpha so alpha is the the cosine of size side a1 squared plus side 2 squared minus x squared minus y squared and then divided by um, two times uh, or, or the square of um, a1 plus a2 so you can see a1 is the length of our we'll go down here this yellow one and a2 is the length of this sort of bluey turquoise one so they're the different lengths of sides now it might be better coding rather than just using a b x and y x and y is fine for the end point um, but even then I'll probably call it X end point and Y end point. And then A1 A and A2, I'll probably give it the actual name of this, this arm section. So this might be arm section A. So I would call it in my code arm section A. And that might make it read a bit easier when you're coming to this. So we can see that Q, 
um, if we know that the the size of this particular um, triangle here, this angle here that we've uh, we've just calculated because we've just calculated alpha, we can work out what Q2 is because it's essentially the opposite. If you had a, a circle and you took away um, everything else, so pi minus alpha will give us Q2. So again, that's just a nice little, if we had a little circle overlaid there, we took away that section of the pi, whatever was left would be Q2. So we can use that to figure that particular angle out. So we've got Q2. So now that we've got Q2, we can work out, um, we're, we're on our way to working out what Q1 is. But before we do that, we need to just work out what this uh, beta angle is. So the way that we can solve this is, we need to find out what this final triangle looks like um, by figuring out this value of beta. So in turn, that can provide the Q1 because we can use that same thing that we just did a minute ago, and that'll be the servo position. So A2, which if we look on our little diagram here, um, A2 is this uh, bluey, greeny piece. Um, and then the sign of A2, which is this, this imaginary triangle here. So we've got this, this line coming out. We've got this uh, imaginary right angle triangle here. So A2 sin Q2 is the sign of Q2. Again, using that soccer toe, we can work out what the length of that is. And that means that we know um, what that final triangle there will look like. So now we've got that final triangle there, we can then work out what the side length of that is. So the side length is A1 plus A2 cos Q2. <laughs> so these look quite abstract. It's a lot easier to do when you're actually coding this and you've got these kind of diagrams to figure it out. Or you can use some other piece of code which we'll look at a little bit later on. That makes it, this a lot easier to do. Okay. So back to our original triangle, uh, we can state that there's actually a relationship between this uh, this uh, upsilon, is it, the little y symbol, and the length of sides x and y. So upsilon is this uh, this angle here. So q1 equals a tan 2 x and y minus a tan 2 a to sin q2 and then a1 plus a, cos, a2 cos q2. So that will give us this q1 um, angle here. And to work out what Q2 is, I think we've got uh, another one for that as well. Let's let it redraw everything. There we go. Q2 is A cos A1 squared plus A2 squared minus X squared minus Y squared divided by 2 times A1 times A2. And that will give us Q1 and Q2. So we've got two very simple formulas. That's very simple. We've got two formulas there that if we pump in the, those values, it will tell us... Um, what those angles need to be for each of uh, the servos. So servo one and servo two, which in our robot will be these, uh, this black stepper motor here and possibly this other one up here as well. Cool. Now there might be a scenario where you actually get a negative value. So if the, um, the Q2 is negative, so you can see there it's, um, it's, instead of it going that way, it's going the opposite way. We simply just put a negative sign in front of the a, the, the a cos function. So we can say Q2 equals minus a cos and then the rest of it. So it's very simple. We could just do a test. Is the number negative? If so, we can use this other algorithm. And I think basically this is just going to show us how we can work out uh, Q1 and Q2 if uh, Q2 isn't negative. So that's the same function there. So we can simply have just like an if statement there to check is it minus uh, minus one or lower. Cool. So if you like what I do and you want me to make more of these types of videos, please give this video a like, drop me a comment. Uh, and if you've not already subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. It really means a lot, a lot to me personally. Uh, it really helps me. Uh, it's the, the reason I make these videos, if I'm honest. I like seeing that subscriber count increase. I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock GMT. So uh, if you want to join on the, uh, the live chat, you can certainly check out uh, me at uh, seven o'clock i think at the end of march we jump into british summer time so we'll be kind of aligned with us time zones again but at the moment we're up i think about an hour in front i think so let's have a look at uh, inverse kinematics in python we'll look at forward kinematics and also inverse kinematics using jupyter notebooks right so i'm just going to jump over to a browser because i'm going to be using uh, google colab jump over here oops why is that why is that not on there? Let me just adjust my desktop for a second. Um, let me move that down. It did this before, actually. Let me see if I can... I think this is a bug in Ecamm. 
Let me just jump back there and let me see if I can get this to, to recognize that that's the application at that time. Okay, so Google Colab is uh, an environment, it's like a free environment where you can write Python programs and you can write them in sections of code uh, at a time. So what's really cool about this is you can intersperse this with text so you can kind of create interactive workbooks. Um, I call these playgrounds, but um, this is essentially a Jupyter notebook. You can actually use a Visual Studio to create these or you can host Jupyter notebooks just by installing a uh, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab uh, on your computer locally. Uh, but if you go to Google, if you go to collab.research.google.com, you can create your own uh, and it's completely free. It actually connects you to a Python 3 backend on some kind of Google server, which is pretty cool. Right, so we're going to play first of all with some forward kinematics. So I'm going to run the code. This is this is what's cool about these Jupyter Notebooks. You essentially just hit that little run button there and it's now run those five lines of code. So we're going to import NumPy. This is just to help us do kind of mathematics stuff without having to bring the maths library in. Matplotlib will help us actually draw out our angles in a minute on a little plot, little chart. And then these Matplotlib widgets and sliders um, and the IPy, IPy widgets and widgets and the Python display stuff. That essentially lets us do things like little in user interface sliders within our Python code, which is also pretty cool. So what we're going to do next then is just define some lengths. So for the simplicity of this, I'm just going to define the lengths of one, one, and one. So this is the three sections of our robotic arm. And then we're basically just going to pump in a couple of angles to start with. I don't think it respects these, but anyway, so 90 degrees, 45, and 180, just some arbitrary angles in there. And we also need to convert these to radians. So radians um, are uh, still a movement, uh, still a measurement of an angle, um, but they not they don't add up to 360. I think it's 180, something like that. So anyway, NumPy can help us with that. Basically, we just put in those angles, those three there. Do um, NP dot radians, pass in that as a parameter, and then what pops out is a bunch of radians. In fact, what we could do, we can inspect that. If I just run that piece of code there, I might decide I want to look in here and say um, let let's uh, print. Actually, I'm not even going to print, I'm just going to type in angles rad, like so. If I just run that now, we can actually see there what they actually look like. So, uh, so 180 is 3.1415926.5. That sounds like pi, doesn't it? So this is what uh, happens when we convert things into radians. Now, I might not want that little code block there. I can actually delete it. There's just behind my head there if I scroll up. There's like a little code block thing. I can just interactively get rid of that. Now, because I've run that code already, I can just jump to the next piece of code and run that as well. So it's nice and simple to be able to sort of debug your code interactively and also document it with some nice uh, markdown text as well. So this next little function here, def plot, takes some of those angles that are in radians and it's simply going to plot them out. So the X and Y position is going to calculate some positions which is this next function down here. We're going to pass in what those angles are and then it's just going to basically plot this out. So if I just run this, you know, I don't think anything will happen with it because um, you don't actually see it just yet. It's the, the next but one function. So this next block will calculate the positions. This is the bit that does the sort of forward kinematics. So it's basically just going to go through each one of those um, angles that we've passed in and it's going to plot them. So you can see there it's basically just plotting in the sort of vector lines that are all joined together. Now, if we now run this last block, we now get a, an interactive little chart. So if I just move these sliders, these are the angle that these sliders are. So angle one is this uh, the, the sort of origin point. Angle two is the next one along. So you can see that we can interactively sort of bend this around. And then the third one is the end point. It seems to be just like one Aussie. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, is that because I passed that in incorrectly? So anyway, there we go. We can see that we can uh, interactively play around with um, our Python code, which is pretty cool. So these these are these Python widgets that are specifically designed for Jupyter Notebooks. So that's how we would do, um, if we wanted to move this endpoint manually and we had these three sliders, uh, essentially this is what we can do. We can just move the individual servos and hope we hit the place we want but that's quite laborious you end up sort of moving each one a little bit at a time just to get to the position that you want so that's forward kinematics 
So inverse kinematics, if I just move to this next tab, um, it's a little bit more involved, but we'll see how that code works out. So again, the very first block of code is just bringing in all those libraries and things that we need for Jupyter Notebooks. This next function will calculate um, for, and I've actually, we've hard coded the number of angles. We could have that as a little array, but uh, we've just hard coded it for now. So we're passing in the X and Y, which is our end point where we want the end point effector, the camera or the, the gripper or whatever it is to be. And then the length one, two and three are the different lengths of our robot arm. So this, whatever this particular length will be and all the other sections of the robot arm as well. So you can see here we're doing these uh, R, that's what we talked about in our little demonstration a second ago in our theory. So R equals the square root of X squared plus Y squared. The adjacent side is R minus L3, the length of three, the cosine angle two. So that's R adjacent squared minus length one squared minus length two squared divided by, and then we've got two times length one and two. Uh, we then got um, the um, R cosine, which is that A, A cos we looked at a minute ago. Uh, we're basically bringing in that cosine angle minus one and one for the parameters on that one and then we'll be basically just working out some more of these angles so you can see that length k1 and k2 are just calculations for lengths one and lengths two and it'll give us the angles that we need so then we can return once we've figured out what these angles are we can just return those three values so we plop in what the end point is that we want to the end point uh, x and y pass in the lengths and then it'll pop out what each of the angles should be for each of the joints, which is pretty cool. So I think we just need to run that function there just so that it knows about that. And then we can plot the chart. Now this looks really complicated. It's basically just to make the chart look pretty. So we don't have to worry too much about what's going on in there. We simply just pass it the X and Y, the lengths one, two and three, and it will draw them out. And then finally, this last piece of code here, this will draw onto our Jupyter notebook, those sliders. We're gonna have two sliders this time, but just for the end point, and it will work out what the position needs to be for each of the servos. So I've called this playtime. So interact is basically just plot the arm. Thanks Thomas for subscribing. Just going to turn that off just in stream elements for a second. And let's just press on the play button there. Right, so here we go. So you can see lengths one, two, and three. I've made this so you can actually play around with these as well. You can make them longer and shorter and whatever. And you can then also just position where you want the the uh, end point to be. So if I just go and move that to minus 1.1, you can see there's minus one, minus three, and then plus one, plus three. And similar with the Y axis as well. So we can interactively move around where we want that end point to be, and it will figure that out using inverse kinematics. And this is kind of what you're used to. This, if you've ever used any kind of animation software, you often have inverse kinematics built in there once you've built your rig. And what we need to do with the, often with these things is just define what that rig looks like. So how many sections we got and where they join together. We pass, we pass that into a function that can do the inverse kinematics. And then we simply just need to point, you know, where do we want that end point to be? And it will figure it out. So if I move that right over there, we can see that uh, so interactively moves about, which is pretty cool. It'd be nice to be able to sort of click this and have it move about. So I thought I'd just show you that. That's a very some, some very simple uh, inverse kinematics. I think I put this on GitHub. Let me just uh, quickly find where I put that on GitHub. I think it's just called inverse kinematics. Let me just find that. Yes, it is. So if I just go back over to GitHub for a s oh, why does it do this? GitHub for a second. Don't know what that bug is about there. So if you go to github.com slash Kevin McAleer forward slash inverse underscore kinematics, you can download these uh, Jupyter notebooks and play around with them yourself. So there's a couple there. Um, so yeah, rubber arm with sliders, rubber arm with double underscore sliders and angle playground. I think they're the ones you probably want to look at. In fact, if you open these up in, um, in GitHub, I think it actually says that these are Jupyter notebooks. And sometimes it actually lets you save them, depending if it's been saved by which one. There you go, opening collab. It gets this little button. You can click that, and it opens it up in uh, Google Collab. There we go. Cool. So that's um, a bit of a playground thing. I just wanted to show you that was a, a bit of fun. 
So let's have a quick look at the 3D design of this robot arm. So I think this took me like an entire day and a half to design in Fusion 360. There's quite a lot of work that's gone into this. I uh, had to sort of get the, the calipers out and start measuring up things like um, um, these um, NEMA stepper motors. This is like a standard uh, seven, NEMA 17 stepper motor, the, the kind that you would find in a, a 3D printer. So it's got that sort of six pin on there. And I think you get a wire with uh, four pins coming off that. Like this kind of wire that comes off that. They have uh, four pins coming off that. I'm going to be connecting this up to a um, Pimroni Yukon. These are great for high power projects. And you have these little modules that you can plug in. And one of the modules that they have there is the bipolar stepper motor. So we're going to be using a couple of them. One for each of the uh, stepper motors in our robot arm. So this is a 3D printable, fully 3D printable um, robotic arm. It's designed to be motion control for a camera for product um, photography. So imagine you've got your, your nice product here and you want to have some kind of robot arm come in and sort of swoop around and do all clever stuff. We can do that with our robot arm. That's kind of one of the main uses that I've uh, designed this for. And it uses the standard uh, NEMA 17 stepper motors and it'll be controlled using VM robotics platform. We'll have a look at uh, some of that in a moment or two. So these are the different parts of the 3D print. So I've got uh, most of them here. So this is the, the base section. It does have a hole in it just there. And the idea is you can sort of clamp this. Uh, these are sort of uh, M3 size holes. So you can clamp this to your desk, um, just like you do with um, like IKEA desk lamps or something like that. Uh, and that this houses the, the first step motor for the main pivot so that the, the robot can pivot around on its sort of the Z axis. Um, and there is also a place where we can put um, a red 3D printed part that will cover that up. I've not printed that those out yet. I have bought the 3D print, printing filament for that uh, but there you go it does have that uh, red section as well just as part of the overall aesthetics of this design. So then there's a couple of different sections. I've designed these so that you can bolt them all together. So you can see this has got three sections here for example uh, and these sections just bolt together with the M3 screws. You can actually put a nut on the end as well and I probably will even super glue these together. They've even got holes in there um, so you can put the red section on the front and then close everything and they've also got holes all the way through so if you've got any wires which we will have it'll all be internal to the robot. And they're designed to be quite small so that they're quicker to print and if there's any kind of problems with them you've not got as many parts to um, you know very large parts to reprint you can just reprint the, the little bits you need to. So there is that removable cover for the access to the wirings and you can screw this into all the other sections as well. And that's what it looks like with the, the red section on. Looking forward to uh, printing those out very soon. So the next one is the elbow. So this is the elbow piece just here. This one I think is the end one. It also has these little um, flanges which grab hold of the, uh, the stepper motors um, sort of shaft in there. And these are simply just uh, screwed in with a couple of um, M2 screws I think they are. So these um, elbow sections, there's three different designs of them depending on where in the robot we're actually using them, uh, but they are very, very similar. So these are designed um, to work to print on a regular 3D printer. They do generate a little bit of um, support material because it is sort of a, an overhang shape. So I use the tree supports and it's quite minimal the amount that you have to use for that. Simply screws into the other sections, again, using like M3 screws. Has that removable cover so you can access the wires um, if you want to get rid of some of the weight perhaps you can you can do that and it uses these uh, NEMA 17 stepper motors which are just secured in with a couple of um, I think they're M2 I think they're M2 screws in there one of the issues I've got currently is I haven't got the right size of screws so these are kind of currently sticking up and you can see that they're sort of sticking a bit too high up there so I need to address that by just buying some correct size NEMA screws should get them on Amazon probably this week. That's what it looks like with the, the cover on. Next up we have a, a different one. This is the arm elbow B, which is like a variant of that. And you can see there that, that holds the, uh, this, the pivot point for the, the main stepper motor. Again, it's designed to work on a 3D printer, um, like a regular size 200 by 200 kind of 3D printer bed. Screws into other sections and has that removable cover as well. That's what that one looks like there. And then I've got a slightly different size. You can see probably just here, 
the top one is slightly shorter than the bottom one and again this was just to make the rubber arm have a bit of variance in the design so I basically just made the smaller version of the other one which is the arm A so the reason I did that was potentially if you've got this bolted to your desk and you want it instead of it pointing that way <clears throat> you want it pointing inwards then the next piece that sort of bolts into that so if you imagine, if you imagine that this was here um, it would need to be smaller than this one otherwise it would clash with it as it turned round and you want it to be able to sort of turn round 360 degrees alternatively you can just print them in that kind of orientation like so so there we go that one also has a cover too and then there's the little flange I've got one just here actually I can show you on camera they have some tiny little grub screws in them I don't know if you can see that just there there's like a tiny little black grub screw and you get a little allen key to sort of tie it up and that essentially if I got that pneumo motor there that essentially just goes kind of onto there and then you can tighten it up that's how they sort of connect together and that's got four little um, m2 screws i think they are uh, on the bottom as well so yeah that's how you attach that to the other elbow piece so this is what the kind of overall design looks like um, i've got that one with the arm section kind of pointing inwards i think i've now gone for the design where it's uh, kind of pointing outwards so it's more like that than uh, that top section pointing inwards uh, but you can see there's 70.4 millimeter is that right 70 millimeters so i think that's uh, 704 millimeters so it's 70 centimeters nearly a meter tall so it's pretty tall when it's sort of totally up right there and it's going to be powered like i said by a pimroni yukon because i really like these it's great for powering uh, projects that require quite a lot of juice so these stepper motors are going to probably get quite warm because of the the weight of the arm uh, but this can probably be uh, good enough to uh, to provide the power that we need and it's also got all kind of safety um, over voltage protection and all that kind of good stuff in there perfectly designed for stepper motors and there's eight i think there's 11 sections in total there as well so yeah i'll go over now to the uh, the overhead camera so you have to pardon the mess on my desk at the moment i'm kind of midway through constructing this so you can see here i've got the uh, the base section uh, so that is um, just needs the front bit there's a hole at the back there where the wire can come through and there's also a hole there when this is bolted on the very edge of the desk probably this desk it's bolted to and then we can then bolt this entire piece here we one of the mistakes i've made i think this original part that's the wrong type that needs to have uh, the the other type which is if i just bring this the one I was actually printing that failed you can see that's got the smaller size section uh, and that means that you can have this uh, flange bolted to it in the middle there so essentially that's going to go onto here uh, and that means we can then sort of rotate the arm round like so I'm going to also move it uh, that way and that way and then bolted to this one we'll have this one connected up there you can see again I need to get these stepper motors with the right size of screws because currently that's just not attaching at all there because I've got all that play there and if it if you if I put some um, yeah because of the the roundness of this as well it does need to be quite flush like that to actually fit so I just need to get some smaller screws there and yes yeah, so that can attach there so you can kind of see the the height of this thing is pretty huge and then I've got another another section or two to go on the top there which I need to print out I don't think I've got those to hand yet I've not printed those out yet so you can see these things take about eight hours each to print so eight hours 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 and this was a about 10 hour print so it's been taking quite a while to print these pieces out um, and that's because I've got only one functioning why am I not focused focus focus so there we go uh, I've only got one functioning uh, 3d printer over there the other one is kind of out of action until I repair that I've had this before these Ender Pro printers. They hot end, I think, after a while, after like serious usage, which these ones get. Um, the hot end kind of gets bunged up, and you basically just need to replace that. Um, what happens is you get, if I can peel this off, I can actually show you the kind of effect that happens on there. It kind of gets, it's not very easy to see on there actually, but 
it gets like really fluffy the edge and then you can see that there's just no filament coming out the end and it's, it always prints like um see that it's, it's a couple of minutes about um, half a centimeter worth of print on there already and it's always the same height and then it fails so it's just weird that that happens i've tried changing the temperature um i don't think it's this filament it's the exact same filament i'm using on the other printer that one works fine so i think it's just this was my first 3d printer from uh, ender from uh, creality so probably just needs a bit of a uh, repair i've got an entire kit of hot ends and bits and pieces uh, just down there on my desk cool so that's the uh, the project update so far and yeah the future plans for this so once i've got all the parts printed out and they mechanically work the way i want them to um, because i might rework some of these pieces such as where at the moment all that weight is being um is on um, that uh, small flange and these are not actually i don't know if you can see it, that's not 100 percent um, perpendicular at the moment so what I might do is put some bearings on there some sort of like quite large bearings so that uh, that's taking the weight uh, of the of the connection rather than just the entire spindle taking that weight because that will not help once I've got all those things out of the way next step is then to wire them all up with um, this Pimroni Yukon uh, and write some code that this can communicate with like a regular Raspberry Pi probably over UART then we can use something like Vium to do some clever stuff and basically take care of all that inverse kinematic stuff for us. We can just give it the dimensions of the arm, where the joints are, and it will take care of everything else on device, which is pretty cool. It can do things like motion constraints, which is what we need for our robot arms so it doesn't crash into other things, and also motion paths. So we can actually define things like these robotic uh, motion controlled uh, video around an object. So VM, if you've not come across this before, I have done a couple of videos on this. So it helps you build and configure robots using like a web app. Uh, you can scale your robotic fleet so you can build all your robots and configure them in here. And then um, that means you've kind of got this configuration safe. It's not just on the device, but it's also held uh, in this web app. And it's got a powerful tool set for developing robotics. So if you want to do things like machine learning, you can basically use their servers to do a lot of the machine learning. And it's a lot quicker to do that than doing it on your own computers. And uh, you can operate code um, flexibly on any robot in the cloud or any preferred location. So you can actually do it all on device as well. If you, excuse me, if you wish to. And it has, um, um, connectivity works offline as well for poor connectivity. So if you've not got a great internet connection because it's like wirelessly operating, that's fine too. And the way this, this works is you define your, your robot and all the physical components, so all the motors, the cameras, the base, if it's like a wheel robot in the VM server, and then you can then use their computing, um, their robotic services such as navigation, vision, data capture. Um, you can use all those to then enhance your robot. So basically you can do like no code robotics if you wish using VM. And this for me just help, helps take some of the complexity away from uh, what we're trying to do here. So some of the cool stuff that VM can do, can do data management. So if you're doing um, capturing images for machine learning, it can do that. Um, it can do motion control, which is what I'm very interested in for this project. The frame system helps you build the where the robot is in 3D space. And if it's moving around, how far has it moved in 3D space? All that kind of cool stuff. It can capture all that um, using the frame system. There's a, a machine learning model. There's navigation. There's a remote control. Um, there is... Um, a, a, um, a slam so you can do simultaneous location and mapping you can put all your sensor data in there as well as uh, robotic vision as well and the one that uh, i'm really interested in like i said for this particular uh, project is the motion so looking at how we can move this robotic arm around and have this modeled um, in v vm cool so i do go live like i said every single sunday at seven o'clock um, I think I've already said that one, but that's a little reminder just in there. And we do have merch as well. If you want to get yourself one of these uh, Robot Maker hats, they come in lots of different colours as well. Then you can get yourself one of these. Just head over to kezrobots.com slash merch. And we also have uh, mugs and t-shirts on there. All the kind of merch stuff that you would expect too. And that helps just support the show. If you want to find on Discord, uh, you can go over to kezrobots.com slash Discord. Join our community. It's completely free. just need to uh, fill in the... Uh, email to get the link there you can also sign up to our newsletter by doing that too and if you want to follow me on social media you can do that too by going to one of these number of different social media sites i think i'm on pretty much every platform just not uh, with the same name which would have 
a bit of foresight, I think, would have helped with that. But on um, threads, I'm Kevin McAleer, threads.net. Uh, on TikTok, I'm Kevin McAleer6. On Instagram, I'm at Kevin McAleer. On X, I'm at Kev's Mac. On Mastodon, I'm at Kev's Mac uh, at mastodon.social. And on Blue Sky, I'm at Kev's Mac at bsky.social on there too. And if you want to help support the show, there's a number of different ways you can do that. You can get your name in the end credits, which I'll show in a second, simply by going to kevsrobots.com slash coffee. You can also do a super thanks, um, which I think that's for people who are watching this on replay. I'm just going to switch on the uh, overlays now that got out the main part of the show. There we go. Uh, you can do a super chat if you're watching this live. Um, that essentially just pops up on the, the screen, uh, any messages that you've said. And if you want to join the YouTube membership program, there's a little join button just down next to the... I think once you press subscribe, it gets replaced by a join button. And it's essentially the price of a coffee per month to support the show. Cool. So let's give a shout out to some of the people who have actually done that. So here we go. So coffee buyers, we have... Um, I think this is a simple CY. We've got uh, Mark Lewis, Alex Just Alex. We have uh, uh, Nicholas Han and Steve Phillips. Thank you all for buying a coffee. Really do appreciate that. It's always nice the uh, midweek thing that happens when somebody buys a coffee, and I get very excited about that. And then the only buy me a coffee membership. We have Lee. We've got Alvaro. We've got uh, Mary Louise Mayer. We've got Jeff Johnson, Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, Tom Shemi, and Steve Phillips. And on the YouTube membership side, we've got uh, Dale from Hybrid Robotics. We've got Bill. We've got Warren, Steve. Um, Stephen Cross, we've got Jonathan R, Oxrod39, Vince, John Paul Jolly, um, Alistair Ware, Cassie, and we've got uh, Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates, Hands from Cheer Lights, Michael, and of course we have Tom, who's our longest subscriber. So thank you um, to everybody that has subscribed so far. Oh, we've got uh, Johnny's just become a member as well. Awesome. Thanks, Johnny. Do appreciate that. So yes, that's everything for the main show today. So this is the point of the video where I'll say, why not check out one of these videos here from the YouTube algorithm? Hopefully it's one um, that you'll find interesting that's related to this as well. Um, and by watching more videos, that's that's as good as subscribing, actually. It helps uh, tell you, a YouTube algorithm that you're interested in this kind of content. So definitely check out one of these videos here. And it's at this point, if you're not watching this on uh, live, if you're watching this on replay, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time.